Good morning. Thank you very much for this uh, in invitation to be here to share something from the Word of God uh, for us this morning. I believe God has a, a word for all of us. And uh, this morning, uh, please turn with me to Isaiah 64. Uh, we will start there, Isaiah 64, and then we will look at the life of Jacob in Genesis 32 and 33. I hope you are familiar with the life or the story of uh, Jacob in the Old Testament. Uh, Jacob, his name means uh, conniver. It's uh, not a very uh, popular name. Uh, in Hebrew, it means he was a supplanter, a conniver. He's a very deceitful uh, Character. That's the kind of name that he he he, he was he was given, uh, because when he was in the womb, um, he's the there were twins in the mother's womb, and Jacob was the one who was uh, holding the brother's heel, and he wanted to come out first. You see, but he came out second. So he was uh, the picture there is like Jacob is a grabber. He's not a grab driver, but he's a grabber. Okay, so let's look at Isaiah 64, um, and let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> we'll pray first, and then we will read. Father, we want to thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you for the word that you have for each and every one of us here. We just pray and ask that God, by your grace and by your spirit, you will come and help us, Lord. Help us to hear what your spirit is saying to us from your word. We pray that you enlighten us, touch our hearts, help and aid us that we may be able to hear and to understand you from your word. Bless this word to every heart this morning. Let your presence continue to descend in this place and fill each and every one of us and our minds too, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of Isaiah 64, <clears throat> in verse 4 it says, uh, so, sorry, we'll be, the <clears throat> title of the message is Growing from Jacob to Israel. Right, growing from Jacob to Israel. In Isaiah 64, verse 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the year, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. Who acts for the one who waits for him. And this word wait is uh, significantly found in the uh, book of Isaiah, uh, especially in Isaiah 40, and also in Isaiah 49, and here in Isaiah 64, and a few other places. And here, a significant uh, truth concerning this verse is this. It says that God is the one who acts for the one who waits for Him. He acts for the one who waits for Him. Now, God's action, God's coming upon our lives, coming upon our efforts, coming upon our doing and our direction, uh, in, in every area of our life is contingent, is based upon our waiting. Our waiting, the kind of waiting that we have will determine 
the way that God is going to come upon you and act upon your life and bless you and show up in your life, in your walk with Him, in all that you are doing uh, uh, for God in your life. So the one who waits upon God is the person who has, who has sought God, who is seeking after God first. They have waited or sought God over a period of time before springing into action. So, we are not the person, this kind of a person who waited, this Isaiah verse 4, is a very, very significant verse. It's not just for us today, now for Saramban Life Assembly. This is the word for us. But it's a very important truth, truth for the rest of our life as well. So God acts for those who wait, who have significantly sought Him, waited in His presence to hear from Him and allowing God to go before us, to lead us as, as well as to guide us. Now, this is the way that God usually works. So there's a period, a time of waiting, seeking God, looking to God, suspending our actions and Trusting Him is like a, a, a servant looking to the Master for direction, you see. So with that kind of disposition and attitude, we come before God, seeking after God, and after we have sought God, and then the action comes because God has, has guided us or moved our hearts, you see. Now God very, very seldom and hardly ever does anything based on short notice. He's not a short notice God. So your, our desperation doesn't force the hand of God to work. If I invested a million dollars very quickly into something, into a project, and then it's not working out well, and then I desperately fast 40 days and expect God to work, He's not going to work. He doesn't work on short notice. Now, you have to understand this, all right? And so, <clears throat> so God, so even if the direction comes from God, God has pointed you in a certain way, given you a certain opening, even if the direction comes from God, the idea may come from God, the strategy may come from God, all right? The timing must also come from God. So just because there's a bright idea, we don't spring into action because the timing must be there. See. Remember when Israel was crossing the Red Sea with Moses, Moses stretched forth the, the rod on his hand. Eh? The Israelites didn't jump into the sea then, then you know, just because God said cross the Red Sea. They waited. They waited because the Lord sent a strong wind to blow upon the sea, eh, to part the waters. They still didn't jump in. Until the land was dry. If they jump in too fast, their bulukat wheel and their feet will be caught in the mud, you see. And, and they'll be trapped there, you see. Or kena sangkut, you know. So they had to wait and wait and wait until the wind blew. Uh, until, and the Bible says that Israel crossed the, jo the Red Sea uh, on dry land. You see. So waiting is very, very important, you see. So this is the way God works, you see. So good ideas to do God's work is good. Good ideas, good strategies, good uh, intentions to do, what, to do God's work is good. But the question that Saramban Life Assembly must ask is this, is it from the Lord? There is a big difference between my good idea and God's good idea. Good ideas and good intentions to do God's work does not necessarily mean uh, it is God's idea. So you have to be very, very careful. A lot of Christians got good intentions, but it is not what God is calling you to do. Or is that what God is calling you to do? That's why the word of the Lord for this church is this. He acts for those uh, who have waited. So your waiting is important, you see. Your waiting is for you to seek God, to know from God, is this your direction? Is this your will? Is this your purpose? The idea is good. Social work is good. Helping the poor is good. 
doing a lot of good things. Evangelism, many, many of these things are very great. They're fantastic. But there are certain things, and usually is this. You have to wait and seek the Lord to know whether God is directing you to do these things. So there's a difference between our work and God's work. A lot of Christian work is our work, but is it God's work, you see? For example, I may have the good intention today to sell everything uh, and go to China and be a missionary and then have a farewell dinner and then uh, take all my savings and go to China. Wow, people will say, wow, he gave up everything and go to China be a missionary. It sounds very noble, is it? Very praiseworthy, you know. Wow, big sacrifice, you know. Wow, he's so selfless. He gave up everything, you know. And when I go there, will God be there? Yes, he's there. Because why? God is everywhere. Even when you make the mistake and choose to go the wrong way, God is still there. He won't abandon us. Even when we, are, we have made mistakes and failed, you see. When I, if I go to China, will I get fruits? Yes, I will get some fruits. Maybe I'll get a lot of fruits. But the big question is this. Has God told me to go to China? So going to China can be my work. But is it God's work also? So we have to distinguish this. That's why seeking God and knowing whether it's from God is crucial. If not, we can be doing many, many, many things. But it's not what God has for us or is calling us to do. You see. We are not being led. We are leading God. And so, so good ideas are important, yes. So like verse 4, the one who waits for him, the one who waits for him is characterized by this. He is a person who is ever, forever, and absolutely uh, dependent upon God. He's a person who is absolutely dependent upon the Lord for everything, for direction, for guidance, for things big and small, for all our needs, for all our challenges, for all our struggles, even to overcome our weaknesses. We are ever absolutely, uh, totally dependent upon God to help us. So God is not looking for self-reliant people. He's not looking for uh, creative people with uh, great ideas. God is not looking for uh, pe people with good, great initiatives and with great ideas. You know. He's not. He's looking for people who will first look to God. So God is not interested in how great your ideas are. He's more interested in whether you are looking to God and be, being absolutely dependent upon Him. He's more interested in that. It's not your ideas, not your plans, not your strategies, not your good intentions. He's not interested in your gifts. He's not interested in your strengths. Your strengths are disturbing to Him. Because when you function on your strength, you don't need God. You just need your, your strength is your God. So, we, our thinking is very secularized, you see. We'll come to this uh, afterwards. So, God is looking for people who will first look to Him and first bow before Him and are ever dependent upon Him and they will suspend all, all their grand ideas, their will, their own will, what they want in life. They will come before God and be ever dependent upon God like Jesus did, not my will, but yours be done. We don't have some idea in mind already when we tell God that. We don't have some idea at the back of our mind. And then we say, your will be done, but actually we have made up our mind that we're going to do this. That is not saying to God, your will be done. Is it? So the person who is looking to God for guidance, for direction, for timing, for grace, for strength, for wisdom, and for the Holy Spirit, you see. So who will seek the will of God first before acting. Seek the will of God first before acting. So getting involved, and I know many Christians in many, many churches, 
and in the church where I was serving, the mega church, a lot of them are involved uh, with many, many, many things. A lot of them are involved with many things. Children ministry, la, the same people doing missions, la, the same people doing asli work, as if uh, they're all fighting for a gold medal. You know. They're running all over the place. After service Sunday, drive back, go asli there. And then after that, come back, uh, go and feed the elderly, visiting the, the uh, home for the elderly. You see. Very noble work, you see. But sh- prayer life, uh, so thin only. The ham jim peng is thicker than their prayer life. The prayer life, so thin only, you know. Like a wafer, like a conflict. You know. But they are spread all over the place. They think they are doing fantastic things, you know. God is not impressed uh, with that kind of a Christianity. You know. He's not. not your, your doing doesn't impress Him at all. My doing, my preaching doesn't impress God at all. It's the one uh, who is ever dependent uh, upon God and who is allowing God to lead them, to show them in their hearts, to direct them, to speak to them, to point them in the right way and the right direction. You see. So Jacob, in the book of uh, uh, Genesis 32-33, I hope you are familiar with the story of Jacob. Jacob was the younger brother, Esau was the older brother, and according to the patriarch tradition in the Bible, from the time of Abraham, the blessings that God gave to Abraham is only for the eldest son, you see. In the Hebrew culture, in the Old Testament, all the blessings of the father is given to the, the elder son, the firstborn, you see. But before Jacob was born, God told the mother, Rebekah, that the older will serve the younger. So God told the mother that Jacob is the favoured one, not the elder son, Esau. See. So after they were born, so the mother told uh, and Jacob, and Jacob knew that God was on his side, that he is the favoured one to inherit the Abrahamic promises, meaning to say that Jacob is chosen by God, favoured by God, God, to become a part of God's big enterprise where, where all the nations of the earth will be blessed, you see, and his, their descendants will be as many as the sand on the seashore, and they will inherit the promised land as an inheritance from God, and God will make them great, you see. So he will become a part of God's enterprise. And he knew that God was on his side, you see. So he started to scheme. So he made every effort to fulfill this destiny that God has for him. He made every every effort, tried his level best uh, to make it happen by deceiving his uh, brother Esau for the birthright. Already God has chosen him, but he wants to have insurance policy. You know, he wants to make it doubly sure that God will not miss him. You see. So he cheated his brother of the birthright. Go back and read the story. And then he deceived his father, uh, Isaac, to lay hands on him and bless him with a blessing that Isaac wants to give to Esau. So he dressed like Esau. He pretend to be Esau. And this one he pakat with the mother, you see, to deceive the uh, father, Isaac, to bless him. And the father prayed for him for the blessings of God to be upon him. Then the brother found out and the brother wanted to kill him for this cheating him of the birthright, right? And most of all, getting the blessing from the father when the father prayed for him, you see. So Esau wanted to kill him. The mother found out. The mother told uh, Jacob, never mind, you go to my brother's place, Laban, in Padan, uh, Padan Aram. This is not Pandan Marana. This is Padan Aram. You go there first for a little while. After your brother cooled down, then you come back. So, Jacob tried all his plans, failed, didn't take off, didn't materialize. Now he's a fugitive. He has to go into hiding. So, when he landed in Padan Aram, he saw his uncle, Laban. Laban's name in Chinese is Laopan. <laughs> La- Laban. 
And Laban saw him. Laban said, Oh, hello, Kakinang, Kakinang. Inside Laban's heart, Laban said, No, Kakinang, Jinya Ho Jia. Jiki Yan Ho Se. Meaning to say, Oh, we all Kaki, Kaki. Good friend, good friend. In their heart, you know, many people, when they do business, it's like this. Because we are so good friend, friend easy to makan you, easy to slaughter you, easy to cheat you. Because we are so kamcheng, you see. So, so Laban deceived him. Laban was a very first class ko sao conniver. You know, he's a ko sao se tao la. You know, he crudely, crudely say la. You know, so Laban deceived him to marry the two daughters and worked for him for 20 years. And Laban manipulated his salary and changed his salary more than 10 times. If any sheep or goat, any of the flock was missing uh, at night or eaten by beasts, uh, Masok, Jacob's account. Jacob has to pay. So Jacob has to work in the cold of the night to jaga the sheep, to make sure that nothing is lost, you see. But since Jacob came, Laban knew and experienced it and told Jacob this, since you came, uh, God has blessed me. And I know that God is with you. Now, we all charismatic Christians, we like to hear things like this. So we like to think that, oh, because I come here now, this restaurant is so blessed because of me. But actually, they have a very good cook also. So, so this uh, Laban uh, deceived Jacob that way. You see. So when Jacob left Laban, finally, you go and read the story for yourself. When Jacob left, God told Jacob it's time to leave after about 20 over years of ser serving Laban. When Jacob left, he was much, 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 much more wealthier than the person who hired him, Laban. He became richer, more successful, had more flocks and better flocks than Laban's flock. You see. He was so blessed. You see. So Jacob, so... Uh, so we can plan, we can plan many, many things, but at the end of the day, God will have His way. See. And usually, very often, we will come back to the story of Jacob again, very often God will allow our plans, uh, our desires, our hopes, He will allow our plans to die first. He, he will allow it to come to an end. The things that we are planning, you see. Sometimes the direction that we are, the things that we are doing, uh, sometimes it's in the place of our work, our hopes, our aspirations that God will do certain, certain things in our lives. Sometimes God allows these hopes and these aspirations to come to an end, sometimes to a brutal end. He allows these things to die first before He takes over and start to unfold the plans that he has for us. And Jacob had to learn this the hard way. You see. He did everything that he thought would help God to bring to pass God's purposes, God's blessings, God's destiny, God's agenda for his life, but nothing worked. He laid a lot of eggs, but no eggs hatch any chicken. And sometimes God allows this to happen, to speak to us and to show us a few things, you know. He showed us that when things are dying, things are not working well, things are coming to an end, uh, and we are hitting a wall, you know. When we are hitting a wall, God is usually from that kind of situation, He's already speaking to you. And we have to learn to listen. Things are not working out. It's God's way of speaking to us. What is he saying? He's saying that he's present. It's a sign when things are not working out. It's also a sign that God is present with us. It's a sign that God is with us. It's a sign that God doesn't want to allow us uh, to continue in something in the wrong direction or in the wrong way. And he doesn't want us to continue in that and be deluded, and be deceived, you see. So he allows things to not work out. He allows things to die, you see. He allows hopes to be crushed. 
So it is God's way of showing us that He's still present. He's not blessing certain things because He's telling us that He wants to do something else. When, that, when these things happen, it's a good thing. It's a good thing because God is saving us from the wrong things. That is not from Him and is not of Him. So we have to learn to listen to God in our circumstances. Not just listen to circumstances, but listen to God. That's why you have to wait. The person who waits is absolutely dependent upon God and cultivates that kind of relationship of dependence upon the Lord. Is it? So God is concerned, you see. And God is, that's why God is more, less concerned with our doing. He's less concerned with our other stuff that we are doing, whether it's our work or business, but He's most concerned with our character. He's most concerned with changing us first on the inside so that our hearts, our desires, our inclinations, our willingness is shaped according to Him. It's shaped in His, according to His will, according to His likeness, Romans says. It's shaped, like Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. You see? So Jesus' will and heart and desire is shaped according to and by the will of the Father, wanting to do God's will. That means uh, it comes with a total surrenderedness uh, of all that I have in mind and I give it up for what God has for me. If I don't know what God has for me, but I come to a place of absolute surrenderedness and wait and allow God to show me and to lead me and to direct me as to what He has for me. And I tell you, what God has for us is always better than what we have for ourselves, which we think is good enough. But God has something much, much better for, for us, you see. So character formation, forming the heart, changing us from the heart inside, making us absolutely dependent and fully willing to surrender ourselves, our will, to God's will, is God doing character formation in our life, which is spiritual formation. So spiritual formation of the heart is more important than what we can do or try to do or try to start for God. What's inside. So God is after, first of all, what's inside us, the disposition. What's inside us in our heart more than what we can do for Him. He acts for the one who waits, you see. So he's, God is looking at your waiting before He acts. So if our waiting is thin, out of shape, He doesn't act, you see. He doesn't come true. So for Jacob, his most outstanding character feature in his life, uh, after the 20 years trial under Laban, you know, being cheated, manipulated, deceived, threatened, intimidated, working under, you know, the kind of a boss, uh, intimidate you, you know. Manipulate your salary, you know. I give you all the donkey reasons why you cannot increase your salary, why this year no bonus. And then so he can take that money and change his car and get a BMW. Delay the staff salary. Manipulate their gaji. So they can take the money, renovate the house. Buy a nice expensive handbag for the wife. So you work under the kind of a fella like Jacob did. It's very hard, very oppressive, you see. But when it was time to leave, it was time to leave. But when Jacob left, he was so blessed, you see, by God, you see. So by the time he came out of that testing period, that furnace, that place in Padan Aram, remember this name, Padan Aram, by the time he came out, uh, his most, he graduated with first class honours, uh, summa cum laude. The best of the best. Which is a quality of humility you know, in uh, Genesis 33, verse 3. See. Because when Jacob went out to meet Laban, he heard that Laban was coming from afar. He had crossed, he had come out, left, left Laban, and he heard his brother Esau was coming. Remember Esau wanted to kill him 20 over years ago? So he heard Esau was coming with 400 men. The servant told him, your brother is coming with 400 men. 
If you were in the situation, what would you think? Say it long. Mati. You know, habis. So, Jacob, <coughs> most imp- powerful quality during that time in uh, 33 verse 3 was his humility. Because when he saw Laban coming, he bowed down to the ground seven times. So his bowing was his humility la, before Laban. Seven times until he came to Esau. And the Bible tells us in chapter 33, uh, verse 8 and 13, verse 8, uh, sorry, verse 8 and 13. Uh, Jacob two times used the word, he addressed Esau as my Lord. He didn't say uh, Taka or older brother, he said my Lord. And then he addressed uh, uh, Esau and said, your servant, verse 5. I'm your servant. So he was a very broken man. So his heart was broken, has learned to subdue himself to to God, I see. So for 20 years, during those 20 years in Padadaram, all his ideas about God, God's promises, God's blessings, God's favour upon his life, what God has for him, all those aspirations or prophecies all became ashes. Didn't come to pass. 20 years he waited. It's like Moses, 40 years in the wilderness call of God, but all that calling became ashes. So when a person goes through such an experience, uh, like Jacob or even Moses, they come out uh, at that, by that time, they are very broken already. They are broken inside. Uh, and you see Jacob's brokenness uh, in chapter 32, verse 10. You see. When he heard that Esau was coming with 400 men, The Bible says that he was, in verse 7, so Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided his people into two camps. So he came up with his own strategy, which didn't work. He came up with plan A and plan B. This family with this wife and this flock will go first and give, (laughs) offer themselves to Laban. If it doesn't work, if Laban, re- if Esau rejects it, then I will use plan B, the second wife, plus the servants and the flocks. And then if still Esau uh, rejects it, then I will face Esau myself. So he's willing to sacrifice his two wives first. He's terrible fellow. So, uh, so, when, uh, so when Jacob heard that Laban was coming, it says in verse 10, This is the way Jacob prayed. He says, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. So you see the way that Jacob prayed. When Jacob prayed this way, he said that I'm not worthy of the least of your mercies, of all the truth which you have shown your servant. So it's very interesting. We wonder what kind of truth did God show to Jacob during the time when he was uh, working with Laban and going through such hardship. So although externally, uh, Jacob was very successful, he was very blessed, as we said just now, and God has increased him. God has blessed him, you see. But uh, on the inside of his heart, he knows uh, that he is nothing. He is not, when he says, I'm not worthy of the least of your mercies uh, which you have shown me. uh, He's not pretending to be humble. He's not pretending. Now, when a person got a lot of wealth like Jacob does, uh, he's like considered a tycoon already, you see. You know, he's very, very rich, you see. It's very hard to say that, Lord, I am not worthy of all the least of your mercies and all the truth which you have shown me. So Jacob knows deeply inside him because he's genuinely broken and has experienced coming to ashes 
ground zero, knowing that I'm really, really nothing. He has touched the ground before. He has felt it, what it is like, you see, inside his soul. You see. So he's not pretending, you know. All right? Now, when we say this to God, God, I'm not worthy, we have to hear ourselves whether we are pretending to be humble when we say that we are not worthy, or are we genuinely in touch with the depths of the, our heart and knowing and feeling this nothingness, unworthiness uh, inside us? That's why, uh, how do we learn this? How do we discover this? You have to spend time with God and learn to wait in the presence of God, in silence. If we make too much noise praying in tongues and singing, which is good, and there's a place for all that in prayer, but during the time of silence where you listen to God, you, like the psalmist, we ask the Lord to search our hearts and to show us and to see if there's any wicked way in us. And believe me, there is a lot. You know why, Inside all of our hearts, uh, there is nothing good uh, in the eyes of God. In the eyes of men, yes, we are a good father, good brother, good Christian, good this, good that. But in the eyes of God, even our, what is good inside us, God says uh, it's like filthy rags. There's nothing good. As Dr. Kwan prayed just now, at the cross, the exchange is not a fair exchange. What good can I give to God? When I come to the cross, nothing. Now, after the cross, still nothing. Every day, nothing. Because as human beings, we are the most selfish people. We are proud. Got a bit of wealth only. Wow, our kapala already, besar already. We think we are somebody already. We are very proud of our success, our wealth, our titles, our position, the respect that people give us, the cars that we drive, the houses that we live in, the clothes that we wear, the size of our bank accounts, the properties that we own. But we don't realize, you know, you know Matthew Perry who died, uh, friends, uh, last week, uh, he lives in a $6 million house in Los Angeles. Uh, when he, he died, he died suddenly, you know, short notice. He couldn't even take his toilet with him. Died. What's there to be? We have nothing. The priceless thing we have is God's mercy, God's salvation in our life. But we have to spend time with God to realize this. Or else uh, we will only know this uh, in the head only, you see. But our heart uh, remains kosong, empty. You see. That's why waiting on God, your time alone with God is more important than what you do. You see. More important than what you own. More important than what you possess. More important than your important appointments outside. You see. Your most important appointment is your waiting deeply and learning to wait deeply in the presence of God until you come to a place of surrenderedness to God, yielding to God. You will be surprised the longer you wait, as you listen to your soul, the Lord will show you how unworthy you are before He shows you how precious you are. And so, for Jacob... Jacob's success and his wealth. Uh, uh, his, he, Jacob has, when he prays, I'm not worthy of the least of your mercies. Jacob has a true perspective of himself, not based on how much God has blessed him. Now, this is where many Christians go wrong, you see. The moment God starts to bless them financially or business-wise or, or their children or grandchildren are very successful, they start to think that they are really something special. You see. They start to lose sight of the fact that you, you are still unworthy before God. So Jacob did not allow his external success, his wealth, he's very, very wealthy. He didn't allow that, all that to blur his perspective 
in regards to, between his relationship uh, with God, you see. So how well to do he was, how much well he, he has did not cloud his perspective uh, before God that he is unworthy, he has got nothing. You see. He, is, he is dependent uh, on the mercies uh, of God. This is Old Testament, you know, Genesis. You know. It's not just laws. It's the mercies of God. You see. So, he didn't measure his, uh, didn't uh, carve his image and identity uh, based on how much wealth he has. His image of himself doesn't come from his success and God's, how much God has blessed him or how well to do he is, you see. That, that, those things does not give him an image of himself, you see. So when he heard from his servants that Esau was coming with 400 men, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And this experience of weakness in Jacob's life uh, is a spiritually healthy sign, you see. His confidence doesn't come from his success. His confidence to face uh, circumstances and a person like Esau, doesn't, his confidence doesn't come from how much God has blessed him. See. So this experience where he felt afraid and distressed is a spiritually healthy sign because in verse 9, uh, the next thing out of this experience of weakness in verse 9, it tells us that Jacob prayed to God. Oh God! He prayed out, you see. Right? Then Jacob said, Oh God of my father Abraham, you see. This experience of distress and fear was good because it, it caused Jacob to turn towards God in weakness. In weakness. This is very important, you see. It's not in confidence. It's not... Oh God, you are with me and you are powerful and you are a warrior, you are my... It's not, nothing of this. You don't even hear Paul praise like this, isn't it? Or Jesus, or in the book of Acts. No, no, only the singing charismatics will pray like this. You see. It's lebe already. La. There is a place for it, la, but this one is talalu lebe already. You know what I mean? So, when Jacob prayed like this, so Jacob turned to God. La. By turning towards God, he came to a place of weakness uh, and God allowed Esau to come to with 400 men uh, to bring Jacob to a place of weakness so that Jacob will learn once again that he is absolutely dependent upon God. So he prayed. Jacob didn't pray uh, the positive type of prayers. His prayer is more like the psalmist. It's a confession of weakness. It's a confession of his weakness, his unworthiness, in the light of God's greatness, in the light of God's faithfulness, knowing that from his experience in uh, Padanaram, he had seen how God came through, how God provided, how God blessed, how God spoke, how God led him, how God uh, sh showed him the way out of Laban's, he, out of that experience, he has seen the greatness of God, the faithfulness of God, when all his dreams were shattered, Burned to ashes, he has seen God coming through, blessing him, providing for him, raising him, you see. And then uh, out of that, he can see uh, that in this time of weakness, again, he's ever dependent upon the greatness, faithfulness, and the goodness of God to lead him in his life. So Jacob is fully aware in verse 10, he says, I'm not worthy of the least of your mercies. Jacob is fully aware of how unworthy he is and how faithful, gracious, and great God is at the same time. So these two dimensions are very, very important, you see. These two equally important dimensions in our life characterize our relationship with God. First of all, there's an awareness of our own wretchedness, our own sinfulness, our own weaknesses, you see. This genuine awareness of our own our true spirit, inner spiritual condition of our life and character and also the holiness of God, the forgiveness, the mercifulness, unconditional love of God towards us. These two aspects, they hold us together in our relationship 
with God. One of the problems with many, many Christians today is this. They don't see uh, how sinful they are. They don't face up to their weaknesses, their flaws, their mistakes. They, they don't see when they are being manipulative. They don't deal with it. How deceitful their hearts are, how controlling we can be, how prideful we can be, how stingy, how selfish, manipulative we can be. We don't face up to this side of us. There is no healthy self-examination in our lives. Why? Why is it this, this aspect lacking in our lives? I'll tell you what is the problem. The problem is, is this, you know. Their thinking is that since Jesus has come into my life, I am covered by the blood of the Lamb. I have the righteousness of Christ. I have been accepted as God's uh, child and I am victorious. I am more than conquerors and they have all these all positive images of themselves. But is this wrong? No, it's not. It's very biblical. But it's used in the wrong ways. When we use this kind of thing to create a positive image in ourselves, we are using these positive Bible verses to cover up our own deceit, manipulativeness, sinfulness, failures, our unclean things, the wrong things that, that we have done to people. We are covering it up. We don't want to face it. We don't want to deal with it. You see? That is the problem with us. And so, they wrong, many Christians, they wrong, they think that there's no need for negative confession. They wrongly think and believe that if I see any weakness in myself, any flaws, any failures, any imperfections in their life, they, they think that if I admit it, I confess it, acknowledge it before God, I am being defeated. I'm not being victorious. This is a very secular way of thinking. Because in secular training, they teach you to focus on your strengths. Isn't it? Focus on your strength. You see. Build up your strength. You see. Your weakness is not very profitable. You see. Develop your strength. In the Christian world, uh, in the kingdom of God, is the total opposite. Your strengths uh, are useless to God. God will not use your strength. He will use your weakness. And He will bring you to a place of weakness. You see. He will bring us to a place of weakness, whether through mistakes, through suffering, times of injustice, long periods of waiting before God, times where we experience our hopes and dreams being shattered. God can give us a job. We go into that place and find that there is a laupan there, like Laban. Go sao konaiva. Manipulate you. Give you a hard time. And your staff, maybe, or colleagues are stabbing you in the back. And yet God has put you there. See? And so God will bring us to a place where we experience this kind of brokenness, where our strengths, our hopes are being stripped away from us, so that as it is happening, we are pushed like Jacob, uh, driven into God, you see, to seek God, and to surrender our hopes to God, surrender our direction, our future, all our aspirations to come, even the outcome, we are surrendering it to God because we recognize that He is not only sovereign, but Lord over my life and Lord over all my unjust circumstances included in my life. You see. And so Jacob came to this place in his life where he had to realize this. So many Christians don't focus on their weaknesses, shortcomings, mistakes because they are told that it's the past. So you don't focus on your past because you just put your past under the blood. I don't know what that means. Till today, Apostle Paul don't even know what that means. Put it under the blood. How to put your past under the blood? How to put our sins under the blood? We have confessed them. We acknowledge them. I did it. We don't ignore it and push it aside, you see. We embrace it. I did it, Lord. My heart was sinful. My heart was wicked. My heart was wrong. It was wrong before you. I sinned against you. That's how the psalmist pray. That's how the Bible teaches to pray, you see. Not push it under the blood. Paul also don't know what that means. 
we charismatics are, we are so famous and notorious for coming up with all kinds of languages, you see. That doesn't make any sense. And so we find that we are being taught, focusing on your weakness, we will be defeated. But this kind of thinking uh, is a singing theology. It is not biblical at all. If you look at Paul, uh, you find it Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. Now, if charismatics today, no apostle with a powerful apostolic ministry will say, I'm the least of all the apostles. I'm the, the worst among all the sinners in the world. Have you ever heard any of them say like this in YouTube? I heard there was one apostle in Malaysia, I don't want to mention him, my friend told me this. He had a meeting conference in, in the stadium and he said, I'm an apostle. If you don't believe me, you can come and pinch my skin. It's so unlike Paul. You see. So Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, Jesus Christ came to save sinners uh, of whom I am the worst. This is towards the end of his life. What does all these teachers, these teachers, this, the closer you get to God, the deeper we get into God, the worse we realize uh, how sinful, uh, the more we realize how sinful uh, the depth of our heart is. That the condition of our heart is worse than we can ever imagine. But in the light of our sinfulness, we come before God and realize uh, that we, like Jacob, we, we are not worthy uh, even of the least of the mercies of Jesus. Just one drop of His blood is more than sufficient to cleanse the wretchedness of my own heart because there's absolutely nothing good inside me. So this is Paul. You see. So Paul, uh, Paul prayed like this. You see. Who is weak? And I'm, I'm not weak in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Who is weak? We are always sorrowful. We are always sorrowful. We are always constantly in weakness. We are in poverty. We are in hunger. We are poorly clothed. We are homeless. Doesn't sound like an apostle, you know. You look at his credentials. His credentials of suffering. We are constantly in hunger, in thirst, you see. He's not boasting about the clothes that he wears. Diamond rings on his hand, five star hotel, he's on his five star prison. It's so contrary to the culture, the Christian culture that we see uh, on, in, uh, among Christians today. You see. So Jacob's exercise, his character was he absolutely was uh, humble before God. You see. And so Jesus also displayed weakness in the Garden of Gethsemane. Towards the end, he's the saving Messiah, the sinless man. And this Gethsemane experience and on the cross uh, are two very significant points in Jesus' life because we see how weak he was. Brutally beaten, bloodied all over, beyond recognition, bunka, the guards had spit on him you know, and brutally, savagely whipped him insulted him. People came to the cross and said, if you are so great, if you are the son of God, save yourself. Come down from the cross. They mocked him. You see. Weakness. You see. And sometimes as Christians, we go through this. When Jesus was going through this on the cross, virtually naked, you know, bloodied, he didn't look like the Messiah, isn't it? He didn't look like the anointed man of God. He didn't look like it. Was, now the question I ask you is, was he still anointed? Yes, he was still anointed. Was he still fully spiritual? When he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Was he still spiritual? Was he defeated? He was still fully spiritual. 
And so there's nothing wrong when we say, God, I feel you have abandoned me. I feel lonely. I feel that you're not here. There's nothing wrong. It's not a sign of being unspiritual. Unspiritual is a, I live in denial of what I'm feeling. And I make people think, oh, I'm a mighty conqueror all the time. You look at Jesus on the cross at Gethsemane. After he rose from the dead, he didn't tell the disciples, uh, don't write this down. Uh. I don't want people to know how much I suffered and what I prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it is your will, let this cup be taken away from me. Sounded like, hey, I thought you came to die. I thought you told James and John, I have to drink this cup. And now you pray to the Father, take this cup away from me. What's happening? Weakness, you see. Struggle, you see. I, f I find it very difficult. I'm really struggling. It's very difficult. I find it difficult to pray. It's weakness, you see. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong, you see. But as we go through this weakness, it makes us even more dependent uh, upon God, you see. The weakness is a window to show us uh, how great God's love is. How great His grace is. How great are His mercies. You see. And then lastly, we see uh, in Jacob that he has, uh, he comes before God and then he offers to uh, Esau uh, his a flock, a portion of the flock. You see. In uh, chapter 33, see, he offers uh, Esau, uh, the, a portion of the flock. And Esau said, no need, no need, no need, no need. I already have a lot. You know, I already have a lot. You see. But Jacob, the Bible tells us, uh, Jacob insists in chapter 33, verse 9 and 11, Jacob insists on giving uh, to Esau and told Esau to take these blessings from the Lord. You see. Now, after Jacob, now when Jacob and Esau saw each other, Jake, they hugged each other and they wept. They reconciled already. And Jacob had already prepared this big gift to give to Esau. Esau says in verse 9, I have enough. And then Jacob insists on giving to Esau this gift he has prepared. If Jacob's name was Mr. Bean Kiasu, you all know Mr. Bean, eh? and Kiasu put together, then Jacob will say, Okay lah, I'm so happy you, you say, I want to give, but you say no need ma. So I'm very happy, lo. I keep back. Lo. You, know, you know, some people, uh, they, they want to blanja you, but they're very reluctant to pay. You're oi cheng, you're msai ta pay you. But not Jacob, you see. Why is it Jacob is so different now? He's so blessed. You know? And the problem with Christian is, the more blessed they are, the more stingy they become. The more tight-fisted they become, you see. Humility and generosity uh, goes together. You know. When God has dealt with a person, his heart is enlarged. You, see. you become willing and say, God, not my will be done, but yours be done. You are also willing to be generous. And when you go out with someone, you're willing to pay and willing to bless the person, you see. Even though sometimes we are tight. You know. But the heart is enlarged, you see. By God. The heart is willing, you see. So Jacob was that kind of person. He could have, e if his name was Mr. Bean or Mr. Kiasu, he would have easily, uh, happily uh, kept back the blessing and said, okay, la, since you say that you have enough, uh, I keep. La. But he gave, you see. Nevertheless, you see. The generosity. So Jacob, it shows us here that Jacob is not possessed uh, by his possessions. He's not possessed or controlled by the blessings that God has given him. You see. He's not owned or controlled or manipulated. He's not kiasu. You know. He's not possessed by the blessings of God. You see. So, Padan Aram experiences has a way of changing us. Changing us from Jacob to uh, Israel. Making us a person who is absolutely dependent upon God and learning to become humble before God in total humility before God, realizing our own unworthiness, how much and because of our unworthiness and wretchedness, 
we are absolutely dependent upon God's grace, who loves us infinitely, even though He knows that we are like this. He knows that we are like this more than we know ourselves. But He loves us just as we are. How great God is. Let's pray. Shall we all stand? I pray and hope that after today, you will make more time to wait upon the Lord and make this an important priority in your life to learn to wait before God and learn to seek Him, learn to wait in His presence in silence before God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray, I pray for all of us first and then we will sing a song. And then after that, uh, any of you who needs a prayer, I'll be very happy to pray for you at the end of the service. Thank you. Let's look to the Lord. Just lift up your hearts to Jesus and say, Lord, I come to you with all that I am. There's nothing good in my life and I've done many, many things wrong, many, many mistakes, I have many weaknesses, I know I'm not a holy person, but I thank you, Jesus, that you died for me because of who I am. And I thank you, Lord, that you love me even though there's nothing good in my life. I thank you that Jesus is the hope of all that I can ever be in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. Lord, I pray that you will teach every heart here, <clears throat> cause it to be awakened, and teach every heart to wait before you in your presence, and learn to dwell before you, look to you, Seek your face first and trust you completely and absolutely, Lord. Lord, we are far from perfect. We are far from being fully surrendered to you. And we have each of us a long way to go. But we pray that, Lord, day by day, as we come before you, learning to surrender ourselves to you, you will help us and you will make us and enable us and teach us each day and step of the way till we are fully, fully yours, dear Lord. And so I pray that, Lord, for my, all my brothers and sisters, that your grace will come upon them and touch them and help them that your spirit descend upon every heart to awaken in us, Lord, a thirst for you, a longing for you, Lord, a dependence upon you, Knowing that, God, we are absolutely nothing, can do nothing without you, Lord. So bless us, Lord, we pray with this grace. In Jesus' name we, we ask. Amen. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. The Lord says in Isaiah 40, For those who wait upon the Lord, oh, their strength shall be renewed. They will mount up wings like eagle. Oh, they shall run and not be weary. And they shall run and not faint as we sing this song still we know that god is here he's teaching us how to be still how to wait upon the lord thank you lord jesus for the wonderful message
singing one more time. And the ocean sighs and time and the strong. Give God a clap of thing, hallelujah. And this one, this is time I want to open the altars for each one of us. Yes, waiting is difficult. Waiting causes us to have fear, brand sisters, but we need to wait. Because it's do not wait, it's not about God, it's all about us. Those who need prayer, those who are in the waiting, you find it very, you are very, very struggling to wait. Come, come. Come to the river of life. Come to the river of refreshing. Those who are heavy laden, you need God to speak to you. You need God to touch you. You need God to comfort you. Come. Don't miss this opportunity, brother and sister, to be blessed, to be strengthened. Amen. May God bless us. May He make His face shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and grant you shalom and grace. Amen. God bless everyone. See you next week, next Sunday for another encounter time, another special encounter with God again. Amen. God bless every one of us. Those who need prayer, come forward. Yeah, and don't miss this opportunity to be strengthened, to be really, really strengthened by God. Amen. God bless all of us. And a blessed Sabbath.